in um, in John chapter one verse seventeen it says the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So when Jesus speaks, he doesn't just use the truth on us. With it, with the truth, will come the grace to do the truth. You'll actually have the ability to do what he says. And so uh, you can tell when our flesh is speaking or when someone else's flesh is speaking. Sometimes it's just the law and there's no ability to fulfill it. And they just tell you this is, this is what the law says. And there's people who speak to us, and sometimes it even happens to ourselves. We're looking for some way to repent, and so we find truth that kind of cuts or truth that, that, that addresses that need, but there's no real grace with it, no real ability to do it. And, uh, but when Jesus is speaking, what he says will be true, but he'll also give you the ability to do it. One way that you can discern Jesus speaking is, is look at the, the, the letters to the seven churches. Here's how, here's how the letters go that Jesus wrote. He says, this is what I find commendable about you. I see your work. I see your labor. I see your faithfulness in the persecution. He starts off with aff affirmation. And then he says, with truth, this is, this is something that I see in you. And it's unvarnished truth. And this is something that has to change. But if you change, if you repent, here's this, and it gives you the incentive. Here's the reward. Here's what will happen. And that three, those three elements of, of him coming to you and speaking affirmation, him being plain and direct and, and telling you specifically what's wrong, and then giving you the incentive to, to overcome, the incentive, the promise. Here's what I'll do if you overcome. That's how Jesus speaks to us. When condemnation is speaking, it's kind of like this wall, this kind of a vague sense that you've done something wrong, but it's nothing specific. You don't really know what you've done wrong. You just feel like God's against you. But he wants you to do, he wants you to overcome, but you don't even really know what it is. It's like a, a wall in front of you that you can't really get a handle on. You can't really climb up over. It's a sense that you've got, you're under the disapproving gaze of God, but you don't know why. That's not Jesus. When Jesus speaks to me, I know what I did wrong. I know what he wants me to repent of. I know it's specific. He's always specific. But with the truth comes the grace to actually do it. And that's one way to discern whether or not it's the Lord speaking. If you could, and, and most of us can't and most of us never will, but if you could just stick your head into heaven for five minutes. One of the things that would shock you is how peaceful it is, how joy-filled it is. how loving it is. It's, it's a loving environment. Here, we're living in, we're living in a, on a dark sphere that is polluted with un, uh, evil spirits, unclean spirits. They're constantly speaking. It's like elevator music that's in the background. It's constantly speaking. And they're saying, you'll, you'll, you're no good. You'll never make it. God, God doesn't have something special for you or you've been disqualified. You'll never make it. It's negative, 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 and it wears us down. That's why God wants us to prophesy. He wants us to come to the meeting house or go to a prayer meeting and, and come out there feeling built up, having been impacted with hope and life and love and, and hearing, hearing Jesus say, I know you. I know, I know what you're going to accomplish. I know you're going to go on from here. I know it's hard now, but it's not always going to be hard. There's hope. That's what he wrote in the seven letters to the seven churches. I, I recommend. There are people who are afraid of the book of Revelation. I tell them, stay in the first three chapters and the last three chapters. Just camp out there. You'll get to know the Lord. You'll get to know his heart. And uh, it'll, it'll bring life to you. Um, if you could stick your head into heaven, there's melodies of what I call the melodies of heaven. And uh, 
uh, I see these in Scripture. For example, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 and 17. This is what it says. Now, and he's writing to new believers who just got saved, and now they're going through persecution, and he had to flee and go to one town, then the next town. He writes this letter, so it's fresh, fresh perspective for, for, for struggling Christians. And he says, Now may the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God the Father, who, is, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. That may not mean a lot to you. It may sound like legalese, you know, just a bunch of words. But listen to it this way. This is J.B. Phillips' translation of that same verse. And he says that, uh, that he's the God of never-ending encouragement, everlasting consolation, comfort you strengthen you, comfort your hearts and establish you in everything that you're saying and everything that you're doing. But I love the line that says, he's the God of never-ending encouragement. I believe him to be that way. I've experienced him that way. Even when I've missed it, even when I've failed, Jesus wants us to keep moving. He wants us to get up. Uh, a righteous man falls seven times, but keeps getting up. And Jesus there's no better there's no better champion on your behalf. There's no one who believes in you and believes in your purpose because he wrote it. He knows what he wrote. And he wants you to get up. So he's the God of never ending encouragement. My prayer these days many times is I'll say, Lord, encourage me. Help me. Encourage me. Especially when I'm low. Encourage me. And then it comes. It comes through scriptures, it comes through sermons, it comes through books that people put in my hand. It, it comes in different ways. Things that people say, even little kids have been used lately, and they've said something. Or you get a note that's, that just encourages you. Well, if he's the God of never ending encouragement, I take all that as from him. I believe it's him trying to get it across to me. Here's another melody of heaven. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in tribulation or in trouble with the comfort we ourselves are comforted with by God. Paul calls him the God of all comfort. Every ounce of comfort that you receive comes from him. I believe it comes from the Lord. He's the God of all comfort. It's like Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Well, he can't make it up, and he's in charge of peace. And if he if he produces peace in me, I take it as coming from the Prince of Peace. Here's one more melody of heaven that if you could just hear, if you could get your head out of the, the darkness, out of the discouragement, out of the clouds, you would hear Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. He's the God of hope. You can't make it up. He's, he's hopeful because he knows the future. He wrote it. If you experience hope, you get a surge of hope, even if it lasts for five minutes. Hope will sustain your heart. Hope will keep you floating. <laughs> Paul spent, he spent a day in the night on the open sea, freezing at night, sweltering hot in the daytime, uh, bobbing out there, just his head, maybe hanging onto a barrel or a board or something. Talk about a hopeless situation. If you've if treaded water for five minutes, you know how hard it would be to spend a whole night and a whole day on the open sea. You don't know what's beyond your circumstance. You don't know what's below. You don't know what's in the, on the horizon. But he said Jesus sustains him. He was able to survive that. I think, I think Jesus produced hope in him. Amazing story of, of, of Paul being in a prison, having done nothing wrong. And everyone forsook him. All the team, his partners in ministry, the churches that he loved, all forsook him. He's there 
by himself. If you've ever been in a large city or been in a circumstance where you, it's just you, it's an amazing experience. Paul experienced this. Here he is chained, I think, from wrists to ankles. They bring him out before these gray-faced judges who are sitting there, and they could take off his head. They could feed him to the lions. They don't care about him. They don't know him. They don't know him like we come to know him and love him. We don't. We see him as a, a man with sterling motives, preaching the gospel, doing it at no expense, doing it to help pure motives. But they don't know anything about him. He's just this man in rags, standing there in chains. They bring him out in front of these justices and they can take off his head. He's alone. Then all of a sudden, the hairs on his neck stood up. And he said, Jesus stood with me. Jesus stood beside him. He could feel his presence. And Jesus says, Paul, we have other places to preach. There's other roads we're going to walk down. There's, there's, you're going to stand before kings. And you're going to testify. And he just breathed hope in a place where there was no hope. Everyone had forsaken him, had forsaken him. But Jesus came, stood with him, and boistered his heart with hope. This is not it, Paul. This is not how you're going to end up. This is not the end. I have a plan for you. I have a purpose for you. We've got places to go. We've got people to see. And, and Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, Jesus stood with me and he will stand with me and he will sustain me. He'll keep me in the future. And he really does. 